Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on when you are. Uh, and welcome to today's webinar, OpTech 2023 Debrief, Key Takeaways and Implications. My name is Adlan Fela. I'm a Chief Analyst at Maravedis and its Venture MDU Experts. And I'm really excited to have you today. So let's see here the slide. Okay, so a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, the event is being recorded. We get that, that question asked all the time. It's very important. Uh, you will uh, have access to the uh, slide deck uh, by email tomorrow. In the meantime, you'll see some handouts available in the platform that you can access uh, immediately. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the uh, question box, and we'll look at the questions as they come in. Uh, and address them during the Q&A at the end of the uh, sessions. And we would love you to tell us how we did and what we missed in the service so we can improve uh, future events. So today we have a great group of industry leaders who will share their insights uh, about the operational technologies for multifamily units. The event should last one hour or less depending on how many questions we receive from the audience and how good our speakers are at sticking to their times. So we have today um, representatives from different parts of the ecosystem. Um, Julian Goodfellow is Vice President of Government Affairs from the NMHC, uh, represents the Trade Association. Uh, Kayan Ross, who is uh, Senior Director of Ancillary Services, we provide the property owner's perspective. Uh, Magnus Johansson is the founder of uh, YBus, which provide uh, managed Wi-Fi SaaS, which provide an interesting story around uh, the technology used for managed Wi-Fi. Last but not least, Michael Stanway, my colleague, has tremendous experience in uh, operations and uh, industry insights. This was my first OpTech, and I was really impressed uh, by the quality and the variety of attendees at the shows, from REITs, private equity, MSPs, and tech vendors. There were exciting pitches on operational excellence, process optimization, and digital transformation. With so many concrete sessions, it's hard to get a sense of what's going on at the show. But the three-day conference was centered around a few themes. The first one was customer experience technologies, followed by connectivity trends, including managed Wi-Fi trends, AI and, AI and automation trends, smart energy and smart application trends, and finally, uh, software integrations. As you can see from the picture here, the uh, exhibition floor was pretty big and well attended. So again, kudos to the NMSC. Great show, I'll come back uh, next year. A few select themes. So out of all that I mentioned, I will be uh, uh, talking over a few of them. And my colleague, Michael Stanway, will dive deeper into uh, some other themes. The first was, of course, is managed Wi-Fi, which is uh, our primary uh, uh, topic of interest uh, coming from the wireless side myself. Managed Wi-Fi, I felt, was covered in a couple uh, sessions about connectivity and intelligent buildings. Um, and my sense was there seems to be still some confusion about the differences between bulk internet and managed Wi-Fi. And the takeaway I got from various discussions is that a great deal of property owners uh, still need to be educated about the business case beyond uh, ancillary revenues to include the operational efficiencies and uh, creating uh, intelligence and use where Wi-Fi is kind of the foundation layer of connectivity in the building. I've heard a lot that enabling staffless uh, customer visits uh, inside the building seems to be a hot use case for connectivity to reduce cost and also add flexibility. 
Uh, I'm also uh, pleased to note that there was a great deal of MSPs present, both in the panels and the exhibition floor, uh, which is to me a healthy sign of activity in the industry. Obviously, the large MSPs, Cox, Comcast, and Charter dominated the uh, panels and exhibition floors with the biggest uh, booths. Um, my sense coming from the wireless side of things, and I have to be honest, I found some of the discussions about wireless in the panels to be rather superficial and high level to what I'm used to in wireless conferences. Uh, for example, I didn't hear anything about uh, network as a service or uh, the role of 5G uh, in multi-dwelling connectivity. Um, the second aspect here is AI and automation trends. So there was a great deal of discussion and maintenance uh, seems to be the primary use case for AI and automation. So use cases include tasks, uh, prioritizing, resource sharing, skill matching, and real-time communications. Uh, the interaction between uh, AI and humans was discussed, but we still were years away from replacing humans in day-to-day -day, uh, management. The last aspect that I uh, looked at was software integrations. So their property management systems are obviously the dominant software providers, um, given their central role in the in empowering daily operation and processes. In fact, PMS allow uh, property managers and maintenance personnel to manage the day-to-day -day operation of the properties, including uh, tenant satisfaction, communications, risk management. The trend here is that with every facet of the business generating uh, data, tons of data about customers and business operations, Multifamily uh, firms are grappling with questions around where to store the data and how to access it from a variety of sources. Uh, the integration continues to provide challenges uh, for data sharing between systems that act in silos. And uh, more firms are looking to pull the data uh, from disparate sources uh, into a single database to keep the data centralized, clean, and reliable. And then finally, I uh, have not seen much talk about integrating these uh, property management systems with a telco infrastructure management systems, which may be, become necessary in the future to manage uh, both Wi-Fi and IoT. Before I hand off to my colleague, just a few quick words about MDU experts, because a lot of you don't know us. Uh, we are spin-off of Maravedis, which has been in the business of research and consulting since 2002. Uh, we provide essentially consulting, research, and connections. Uh, we are headed uh, by a team of veterans and experts from Miami to LA uh, and Chicago. And each of us bring different sets of skills and expertise. Well, you hear about uh, operational and, and hands-on experience on the MDU space from Michael. Tom Gruba is an old friend of mine and an old colleague in the industry who led product line management for Canopy and other important product uh, uh, in the wireless space. And myself, I've been working 25 plus years as a research analyst and consultant in the wireless space. In essence, the, what we are in it for this is to uh, provide you guys with solutions to your problems, uh, especially regarding connectivity. Uh, things such as uh, vendor evaluation, RFP preparation, business case modeling, and Wi-Fi deployment guidelines. We also can help you with connections. Uh, we released uh, last week the top 200 MSPs uh, uh, directory. In the US, and we also uh, provide uh, marketing and sales, sales enablement uh, to customers. So I don't want to spend too much time on, on, on promoting ourselves here, but quickly, uh, there's a research report that's available again. We published in July where we provide a really deep dive into the multi-dwelling unit connectivity space. 
including market size projections and interviews and online surveys. And you can also access the uh, database of MSPs in the US. That's all for me. So I would like now to pass it on to uh, my colleague, Michael, who's gonna provide you with uh, more insights into uh, what he saw at uh, Optech. Okay. I think you need to pass control to me, Adeline. Can you yes. see me? Yeah. Okay. I'm that. You're the presenter now. Great. So there folks can see the first slide. All right. Thank you. So I've been going to Optech for a long time. <laughs> and anybody who's, I see that look at Julianne. Um, anybody who's gone to Optech for any length of time, and the shows prior to that, have kind of seen the evolution of what's happened in the multifamily space. And it's amazing what has taken place. Um, when I entered it, it was, you know, the exciting thing was Direct TV, bringing digital broadcast satellite to your building. <laughs> and uh, this year, Optech 2023 uh, did not disappoint in uh, bringing the high demand elements, the challenges, and also the opportunities across the space. And so Optech was well attended, in my opinion, this year uh, with folks from three specific groups that I'm going to focus in on, and that is property ownership and management as a group, um, private equity and investment as a group, and then services as a group, meaning uh, managed service providers, integrators, and vendors. So from a property ownership and management perspective, uh, this was coming through in sessions in some of the round tables. It was also coming through in a lot of the conversations, which was really my main goal uh, to speak to these groups and ask these questions. What are the opportunities as they see them? Well, one of the things is that amenities, and you're starting to hear this all the time now, amenities are becoming utilities. You don't make a buying decision when you turn on the hot water as to who you're gonna buy that hot water from. <laughs> and it's great for uh, folks like myself who have been on the operational side of providing services to see that happening and to be part of that uh, revolution. And it's no longer uh, just class A properties that are looking at things like having ubiquitous managed bulk Wi-Fi, IoT services, access control, property management platforms, EV charging, which was emerging significantly at the show this year, which I took a significant note at. Full disclosure, I am consulting currently for an EV charging company out of Los Angeles that's doing a uh, large rollout into multiple states, but that's indicative of the kind of opportunity and growth that is out there. And of course, not just the selection of these services and making these priorities and bringing them as value adds to the property and to the portfolio, but what about the infrastructure? That was significant. I think Kalen's gonna talk, you can probably talk all day about that. <laughs> infrastructure challenges, especially the, the messy wire session. Uh, and I'll leave that to you. Uh, but the toss up, do I invest in these older buildings? Do I buy newer buildings? It's part of that whole strategy of growth. And do I divest in properties or do I upgrade them and bring them into current services that can compete uh, with, uh, with the newer properties around me. So Greenfield and Brownfield both create significant opportunities. My personal opinion is for those looking for opportunities to enter this space that, that there is a tremendous opportunity on the Brownfield side given the fact that there's over 22 million homes passed and a good half of those are 20 years old or older. So some of the hurdles and challenges uh, getting feedback from uh, property ownership and management folks I got a chance to talk to is how do I make sure I'm getting a good balance mix of technology? What must I have versus what would be nice to have? And so boiling that down to having a real 
clear product roadmap, a service plan that integrates with the class of your property, the intention uh, long-term for that property, and also uh, the emerging neighborhoods that are gonna be competitors with you in that locality. And then of course, directions, so many things happening, right? The industry trends, I mean, look at the mag, mag, huge shift. I was gonna say Magnus shift, <laughs> but very large shift after COVID. What did we find out? Well, all of a sudden, our nice to have managed Wi-Fi system became the working lifeblood and the education lifeblood of everybody living in multifamily. So that really was a seismic shift, which is the word I was looking for. Being able to cope with that, come out of the lessons that we've learned, things like having a service roadmap so that we can keep current, but we're not getting out too far ahead, right? Two years ago, you didn't hear terms like multi-gig into the unit or Wi-Fi 7. Right, so there's a lot of emerging technologies and decisions to make long term. What's the balance? So I got also an opportunity to speak with some private equity folks and investment folks. I spent a little bit of time myself um, in uh, in acquisition mode, uh, which is typical of growth of some of the companies around us, um, all kinds of acquisition opportunity and market entry, whether it's investing in multifamily, real estate, whether it's uh, being a service provider or even the integrators and vendors, they're all emerging markets as a result of the opportunity to invest in a property. And then of course, that growth and value creation plan really has to be linked directly to the investment goal. And we don't always see that, which is interesting because there's a lot of assumption as to what the results will be. There might be a couple of nice spreadsheets to take the two spreadsheets and put them together and they make one really beautiful spreadsheet. Uh, but the reality on the ground um, changes uh, in the economy changes uh, culturally that have happened have really changed the view on how I'm investing my capital and what I'm investing my capital in. Hurdles and challenges, these common themes were coming up and I'm sure there are no surprise. Uh, most private equity firms and investment firms, they're pretty solid when it comes to qualifying, uh, doing their diligence valuation and even executing on the acquisition. But then comes one of the most critical pieces of that effort and that is the transition. It's very common to see, especially in smaller acquisitions, no real transition plan or budget of integration. And we can look around us and see folks that we know and companies that we've uh, dealt with, feedback from within the industry from all levels where that has not been an optimal experience for a number of property ownership groups, as well as the PE firms that originally invested that capital. So transition, that's something I, I am a firm believer in, having a transition budget, having a transition plan, and making it a rapid one to make sure that you're maximizing the opportunity for the success of that acquisition. All of the financial elements that come to play in it, a lot of that is pretty common to the investor, but not necessarily the target. And those are things like turning CapEx uh, into a, an acceptable return on that investment, those timeframes and seeing the actual results, meeting expectations. When it comes to operating, making sure that we've got control on our cost of goods. What's the biggest single cost of good for a property these days, at least on the provider side, it's bandwidth, right? And then on the operational side, it's, it's labor. So those are always gonna be elements that may or may not meet uh, the existing requirements, but they also may present opportunities when it comes to acquisition. And so those acquisitions can be pace setter. Coming out of the gate, 
with uh, the best and the brightest and the strongest and the fastest and the cleanest, uh, well, we all know what that costs. That costs money. Or there's opportunities where providers haven't done so well, properties haven't done so well. And there's investment opportunity where you can actually be considered to be a rescue for that. Although I think the appetite certainly on the PE side is becoming less and less just due to the emergence of new markets and overbuilds. And then of course, efficiencies. Efficiencies really do uh, make up the formula for success on an ongoing basis. And that really boils down to your platforms. In other words, your apps, your SaaS, um, your technology stack, the processes that uh, either ensure efficiency or ensure inefficiency. And then of course the people element, because at the end of the day, uh, we're dealing with humans to humans and putting people in the right um, position for success personally, as well as professionally, really does play a key role in success. Looking at the MSPs, uh, integrators and vendors, got a chance to, um, to get some great feedback there and also see uh, good examples in, for example, the uh, opening pitches on the operational excellence at the show. Uh, again, I was very surprised, pleasantly, to see the emergence of things like uh, EV charging and even managing parking uh, becoming significant challenges and opportunities uh, for the REITs and for also uh, investment firms as well as new providers that are entering the space. So those opportunities are uh, things like market density, making sure that you have a nice grouping which reduces your service side costs. Bulk services are no longer the exception, they're becoming the rule. We talked about turning on the hot water and it's no longer just managed Wi-Fi. There's all types of services that uh, can go into operating a property and providing service to that property and those portfolios. Getting those services in place quickly uh, and efficiently um, while making them high availability and low touch are really the kind of the magic formula for bringing services to a property by the MSPs, by the integrators and the vendors. Then they're all, uh, linked in that process, each one has a very strong interdependence to be able to ultimately deliver services to your property. And then of course, maximizing revenue. I think that kind of is pretty obvious, um, but are you looking at all of your opportunities for revenue or are you just focused on one single product? Well, today, and, I, and folks on this call can talk about that, really the aggregation of a lot of these services is becoming the norm and the expectation of having those skill sets and expertise across different disciplines is more and more becoming the advantage uh, of some of the industry leaders certainly uh, especially on the integrator side so hurdles and challenges uh, again i don't think there's really any surprises here from a technical and a product standpoint are we current are we, ex are we anticipating what's coming? Are we getting out maybe a little too far or are we really looking at what the runway is for services? And I think again, some great examples of that is uh, multi-gig service, managed Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7, and we're now even seeing the integration of, of other spectrum into those services, private LTE, et cetera. So along with that is refresh planning, right? Because if you're current, but you may even have in your right of entry agreements, uh, the requirement to stay technically uh, on pace with the industry, that's a pretty loose term to say, look, if you can't deliver the services, we'll get somebody else. And then of course, supply chain, right? that's a, a lesson we all learned the hard way over these last couple of years. The good news there is there's a lot of emerging uh, local manufacturing and and other options, other uh, vendors entering the product market and providing more options uh, to MSPs, integrators, and vendors. Operationally, um, how 
you go about delivering those services is impacted by you know significant challenges on the platform side and what i mean by that is provisioning services authenticating services managing customer data integrating with customer care and field services how that permeates uh, and integrates with your network operations and even on the hr side to make sure that again that human element is being considered and you have the right people in the right roles it really is an organism when you look at it and along those lines a term you may be familiar with the life cycle whether it's a product or a portfolio or a property you can really break it down into specific discrete phases there's the right of entry and say and sales phase well it's great we've got a contract i think the the term in Salesforce is closed one, yay. Well, that's the race, what I call the race to the starting line, because now you've got to build it, you've got to launch it, and you've got to test it, you've got to certify it. You have to operate it for five, seven, 10 years. You've got to refresh. And then of course, you've got to renew. And it's not uncommon for good solid uh, MSPs to see renewal rates of 96% and higher. Uh, I, I spoke with one um, provider and he's been around for a good amount of time. He says that his renewal rate is 100%. Imagine that. Uh, sorry, Michael, uh, can you uh, maybe speed up a bit uh, for the sake of time so we can? Uh, this is great content, by the way. Uh, you better. Just, uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I'm getting the hook. No, no problem. Listen, I was raised with six sisters, so I have no pride. Uh, so I think competition is also self-evident on that front, keeping up with the independents, the giants, the disruptors, and of course, the low ballers who create unrealistic expectations of true value and cost of products. So what do I really need? Whether I'm investing, whether I am operating, whether I am owning and, and managing, where can I get an unbiased look at the technology plan, a roadmap, and what the options are for my properties or portfolios? How can I get a clear and efficient plan to maximize the integration of that acquired asset, whether it's a property or a company, to meet or exceed my investment goals? Am I taking a sound operational process-driven project-style approach to the growth of my company and services. I call that putting the fund in fundamentals. Is it even possible to get a truly neutral and unbiased opinion? We do have the ability to work with uh, folks across the different disciplines uh, and verticals within the industry, and provide an unbiased and a neutral approach, and are happy to speak after the call. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, sir. Great job. And again, uh, sorry, I have to, uh, you know, uh, speed you up. Um, let's see here. So, anyways, uh, let's see here. Okay, um, maybe for the sake of time here, what we can do um, is um, have both Julian and um, Kellen comment about the um, the optech. So maybe starting with you, Julian. Uh, what, what are your key takeaways uh, of Optech 2023? How how different was it from last year? Can you hear me? Uh, I think you're on mute. Huh? Uh, seem to have some audio issues. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, Kaylin? Ah, uh, there you go. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Well, that's fun. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the patience with that. Fun techno technological problem. Julianne Goodfellow, I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs at NMHC. I'm hoping that you're all familiar with NMHC, but just in case you're not, 
for the National Multifamily Housing Council. We represent owners, operators, and developers of multifamily, as well as suppliers. Uh, OpTech is one of our flagship events. Uh, it's a fantastic conference. Uh, it's one of my personal favorites from what we do at MHC. Uh, and I'm thrilled to talk about it. It was a great conference. I think it was our biggest yet, and the energy level was spectacular. Um, I was just saying to someone yesterday, our annual meetings in January, and I can just imagine, imagine how different the energy will be there when, because that's a really focused heavily on transactions, and as the industry struggles with the current market, uh, that energy will be very different than the excitement, enthusiasm that we're seeing at Optech. So really appreciate the energy Last, two weeks ago. Um, so major themes for Optech this year. Um, certainly AI was, I think, mentioned in every single session. That's, you know, there's every year there's something that everybody talks about. Um, it's not always what we, what we predict it to be, but AI was a huge conversation. And with that, an increasing focus on risk management, um, cybersecurity, data privacy, how those all kind of work together. I think that Owner operators are really excited about the potential of AI, but also trying to navigate that within the risk. So those are really those are really big topics. Um, generally, how multifamily businesses are positioning themselves to meet customer needs, uh, to meet to have a competitive edge, manage risk, and also drive innovation and efficiency. Uh, namely, the value proposition. We a lot of folks on the, well, many panels talked about the value proposition of technology innovations. Certainly the customer experience, customer centricity is hugely important. I think a lot of folks there were looking at how they can improve their resident experience or their potential resident experience with various technologies. Um, also resource allocation, both from the financial side and also from the human resource side to both uh, support the technology adoption and also operational improvements. Uh, reputation management was another big topic, and of course, risk management and compliance. We're seeing an increasing number of uh, actions on the federal and state level that are requiring uh, new compliance challenges for multifamily providers, but uh, owner operators, but also suppliers, and that was a big topic as well. Um, so those are some major topics. Um, we can get more into the to Wi-Fi space as well, but I, those are kind of the highlights that I really focused on, uh, or took away from that. And I'd also mentioned just to put on your calendars for next year, OpTech next year will be in the Washington DC area at the Gaylord National Resort and Convention Center in National Harbor, Maryland. Uh, if you joined us a few years ago, you were there. Um, it's October 21st to 23rd. Okay. And what was, it, what was different from last year to this year uh, in terms of the OpTech, besides the cost of capital going up and uh, on the technology side? I, I think, as you both said earlier, the explosion of more and more products out there, um, I think there's a, um, the, the products seem to be improving. Um, there's a better understanding of what owner operators need. I think at the beginning, especially if I think about smart home tech that came out and a lot of the technology that was starting off, it was a lot of it was very um, focused on the resident experience, but really in this very narrow view of what the resident needed. A lot of times I think it was not thinking about how that actually works for an owner operator, how they actually meaningfully de deploy that within a property. And I've seen a shift to really refining the product and helping the owner operator solve pain points that make it challenging for them and also for the resident. And I've seen that evolution, which is I think pretty exciting for the industry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I won't ask uh, Magnus what he thought of Optech because he hasn't had the chance to go there. So, um, what about you, Kaylin, uh, from the property owner's perspective? You know, I know you had a session on uh, entangling wires, and what, what are your overall impressions and takeaways? Yeah, so happy to be here, happy to help out. I feel like it's my responsibility as someone that's gone through some of this to be transparent, right? And and give some tidbits into what makes us successful and, and, and what what are some catalysts for failure, right? So I'm hoping through this, you know, obviously um, focusing on managed Wi-Fi and technology enablement and that managed Wi-Fi being that backbone to be able to adopt all these other technologies that are available to us. Um, I, I wanted to, at least in this, give some pointers and some some key takeaways or some key advice for those that are listening that maybe weren't at Optech to help out with their next adoption of technology, whatever that might be. 
I'm going to focus specifically on managed Wi-Fi because that's where I have the most experience, but the principles remain the same. So I'm going to focus on managed Wi-Fi and new developments. Those principles remain the same for existing communities as well and other technology uh, adoptions, right? So, um, you know, when, when we talk about managed Wi-Fi being like the backbone for connectivity, right, we got to remember that managed Wi-Fi also requires a literal backbone right for connectivity and manage wi-fi is 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 a great product um i'm all for it i'm putting it in all my developments right we we believe in the business case we um but for manage wi-fi to be successful it requires uh, a successful deployment which means building infrastructure your wiring and all that needs to be accurate and correct and so uh there's a past and a present, right? When it comes to developers and construction, I have a neat, I have a neat view because at Avalon Bay we have our internal construction folks, our internal developers, and then we operate the building after. So I get to see from the ground up um, what happens and where we're successful and where we have failures and how to improve, and then what that does on the operation side with our residents and property managers. Um, so in the past, right, a lot of times before we started talking about bulk and managed Wi-Fi. Right, our construction folks, um, they or electricians, whatnot, would would run our Cat six or run our cabling, and then they would, you know, terminate it however they felt like they needed to terminate it, and uh, just exit the building. And if an MSP wanted to come in and serve that community or serve that person or that resident, they would come in and fix it, and no issues, right? But when we're talking about managed Wi-Fi, the responsibility changes. And the responsibility changes in the sense that we as owners or your GCs or whoever's installing this, right? We are required to install a product or install the wiring so that it can accept the speeds and accept these new technologies. And so these technologies can operate the way that they're intended to, right? So I kind of have four things that I go through and they're, they're, they're as, a, as a developer, um, they're kind of loaded. I wanted to keep it kind of high level here, but they're good things to, to dig into. Um, the first thing is there's a need for design. Uh, oftentimes when we're developing or implementing new technologies or whatever it might be, low voltage is the last hour, right? It's, 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 there's a bucket of money and just figure it out. The importance of having some design first and understanding where wires need to go, where units need to be mapped, how things are gonna be installed, where they're gonna be located is the first recipe for successful technology deployments. If you don't have the ability to get a, a, a legitimate design on paper, right? The same, the same principle can be applied with just um, talking about it and making sure you guys understand the, the, the infrastructure that's currently in the building, where things are mapped, and just spending that time up front, understanding the design and, and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, the, the second thing for me that is big is redundancy. I always ask about redundancy, not only redundancy in the sense of, hey, do I have another circuit or another way for our residents to be served in the event internet gets shut off? I'm talking about redundancy as an owner. How can I ensure that I've got pathways and the infrastructure to adopt the new technology that's coming in the next five years? Because we know that there's new technology coming. We're already talking about Wi-Fi 7. Next Optech, there's going to be something new. Um, Skynet is upon us, right? Everything's changing. So uh, how do I make sure that I have redundancy and pathways to adopt anything new moving forward? Uh, number, number three is cable certifications, right? You have to hold people accountable that are pulling your wires. And those certifications are a good way to hold those folks accountable, whether it's your GC, whether it's you as a developer or whoever it may be. It's a good way to hold accountability. However, if you think as, a, as an MSP, if you think that just because you got a certification or a certificate, if you use that as 100%, everything is good to go, I'm just gonna install and leave, then shame on you. Because uh, if you're not doing your quality control, if you're not reviewing your, the network and making sure that your devices are accepting the speeds that they're supposed to accept before you exit the building, then shame on you. And that's gonna be a tough time. It's gonna be a tough time for the residents. And it's gonna be a tough time for the MSP or technology vendor. And with that, my last, my, my, my number four thing, right, is these deployments take a partnership. 
it takes an owner partnership with our our providers um, it's never a one and done thing everyone's learning and trying to improve and be better but that partnership and that transparency is super important uh, without it you're going to have a hard time and um, what we know is that there will be issues right so you have to get in there together set expectations correctly and and whatnot and and, and adeline i have i have four more things that i could say real quick when a partner is looking for their msp provider just four more things they can go through if we think we have enough time um so uh, gonna, let's yeah go ahead yeah i'll just do it real quick okay four things okay. that i think pro owners need to to ask providers one, you need to define what managed means for the provider. Managed is different depending on who you are. How sophisticated is the network, right? So define what managed is, define what you need as an owner. Um, ask what the quality control process looks like at install. Make sure that there's things there that uh, are structured and have been doing for, for many years, right? Um, in my experience, MSPs that are really flexible those are the ones where we have a lot of difficulties, right? So those processes and procedures are helpful. Number three, ask, ask your MSP how and when and in what vessels can they communicate to the resident? Whether it be, is there automations, are there text messages, what's the outage uh, communication look like? Make sure that there's processes in place for that. And then, and then number four, ask for customer service and network metrics. Simply, what's not monitored is not managed right ask about customer service ask about those metrics um and and all you msps out there those are the things we're looking for as owners so make sure you have those and you're and you're willing to provide them i'll yield my time back to, to adeline Th thank you ken i mean very practical stuff so uh, here's what i propose to do we're going to go back to the panel after magnus presentation for the sake of time and to keep the flow uh, going on. So Magnus, I'm going to make you the presenter and, and Magnus is going to show us an interesting story here because we're talking about property owners uh, and uh, Michael alluded to that when you have a consolidation of different property owners using different systems, you know, it becomes quite messy on the connectivity side. So uh, uh, Magnus Solutions helps uh, solve some of that. So okay. you should be uh, the presenter now. And okay. I should show uh, the PowerPoint view. There we go. All right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You're good. Okay. Thank you very much, Adlin. Thank you, everybody, for waiting. And uh, let's see if I can take you through a story. Uh, my name is Magnus Johansson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of YBus. And we've been around since 2015, but I don't think anybody has heard of us because we are someone that's working behind the scenes. But today we are peeling back a little bit of the curtain and giving our view of the future of the Wi-Fi management. And we're not really just talking dreams here. We will actually showcase some reality of what we have been doing. So we have our new logo here. So this is our new you can meet YBIP OS. It's a white label cloud-based operating system that's a game changer for the Wi-Fi equipment vendors and the ecosystem as a whole. So with YBIP OS and the power of our YBUS R&D team behind it, equipment vendors can now deliver a suite of customizable telco branded or MSP branded vertical solutions. No more of this one size fits all. It's time for Wi Fi solutions as unique as the clients they serve. So, let me show you how YBus is paving the way for a disruptive managed Wi Fi solution delivery. But first, let us rewind a little bit and take a look at the time before Android ruled the mobile world. Handset makers were jacks of all trades, but masters of none, you could say trying to control hardware, software, and application. And this approach was costly and actually stifling growth. And fast forward today, and I would say that the Wi-Fi vendors are stuck in a similar loop. Everyone is building their fort, leading to, I would say, inefficiencies, lack of disruptive innovation, and curved growth. So how would I describe the state of Wi-Fi ecosystems today? 
As I said, it's a little like the pre-Android handset makers, each in their bubble. And what is happening? We get a plethora of APIs, patchy integration, and fragmented solution, often missing the mark for what telcos, MSPs, and the business verticals wants. It's like using a map where there is 10x on the map and you can't find the right spot. So, enter us, ybus.com LLC. We call ourselves an exponential organization, as defined in the book that some people might have read called Exponential Organizations. Why new organizations are 10 times better, faster, and cheaper than yours, and what to do about it. Hint and wink from me, let us become let us become your EXO engine. But I will get to that a little later in the presentation. So we are an R&D company, a live SDK, if you like, that can scale on demand. We are 100% focused on unleashing the managed Wi-Fi as a service ecosystem's full potential. Our contribution is the YBIP OS, a Swiss Army knife for Wi-Fi solutions. Scalable, manageable, adaptable, repeatable, and trusted. Smart in short. So YBIP OS integrates with the various ecosystem components. The equipment makers, the application layer, the MSP the telcos to give solutions for the verticals. And we work on transforming the equipment makers brilliant technology solution into brand centric Wi-Fi service solution that meets the demand of MSPs and business verticals alike. Yes, I know. Big things indeed. But don't take my word for it. Ask the Ruckus Service Provider Group. We have had a long and fruitful partnership with Comscope Ruckus, which started back in 2016 with a Photoshop rendering of a GUI, an MVP, and a disruptive idea. And in this public setting, we cannot mention specific telcos by name. So in this story, since Ruckus has a dog, let's think of them as the shepherd dog and us, YBIP OS, as the whistle that helped it direct the flock of telcos into its fold. Initially, there were only two telcos joining us and testing the waters. We had some light integration. Their feedback was invaluable in shaping our journey, forcing us to pivot in 2020 and evolving our platform in what we today call YBIPOS. Since our pivot, seven more telcos have flocked to our robust joint solution proving the market is ready for a unified, agnostic, managed Wi-Fi solution. So here's the real deal. Of course, telcos and MDUs find all technology solutions, mostly depending on what they want, that the Wi-Fi equipment vendors offer compelling and innovative solution. But the main issue is, and this is also a tongue twister, is the lack of ready to deliver automated telco branded technology agnostic solutions that can easily be customized based on use cases and customer feedback so today the equipment vendors offer in general two flavors of their technology solution i call the first flavor plain vanilla that is a set of limited in scope pre-made solution that the telco or msp often can resell most of the time, it's branded like Cisco Meraki, Ruckus Cloud, Cambium. All of them have their, we call it, set of, of solutions that is their brand. And then we have the second flavor. That's the kitchen sink. And that means that there is a public API document that the client can use to build whatever they like. And the telcos is neither equipped or inclined to take on that responsibility, especially if they are going after a multi-vendor strategy. In a few cases, what happens is that the service provider buys an MSP or a SaaS with a solution that has been semi-successful and try to make it into their own, and usually with limited success. Why bus and our white label, 
and this is key, white label YBPoS, on the other hand, are positioned as enablers of equipment vendors to meet the needs of telcos and MSPs, allowing, in this case that we're talking about Ruckus, to focus on hardware and technology solution excellence while outsourcing the solution innovation to YBUS and using Wabip OS to deliver a suite of customizable telco branded vertical solutions. So together we are meeting the needs and defining the future of managed Wi-Fi services. And as the panel talked about, uh, as I wrap up this plug for Wabip OS, we also uh, joined the AI, I wouldn't say it, uh, you know, train like that, but we did another pivot and we embraced an AI first approach. And our first iteration of that pivot has been to integrate a set of purpose built AI bots uh, into our platform BI coach, BI analyst, and BI agent. They are trained on various aspects of Wi Fi management and offers possibilities for advanced analytics and customizable services. These are the first generation of AI-driven tools and are essential in solving short-term problems while setting the stage for the inevitable AI future. So the train has left the station and on the AI train that is, and we are on it. And as it continues to evolve, we will embrace and integrate AI solution that solves problems and enables disruptive innovation. Almost home. So we talked a lot about our great partnership with Ruckus. So the MSPs and telcos that are on the, on the call and are in the US or globally, if you're in the US, you got the front row and the ticket to the Ruckus show. So no waiting in line while we pitching and see who else wants to join this uh, YBIP OS ecosystem. And as you have seen, it's not just smoke and mirrors. We got nine telcos capitalizing on this for growth already. And by partnering with Ruckus, you can be onboarded, gain immediate access to curated solution across every conceivable vertical and start offering branded managed Wi-Fi solution that just works. It's not just theoretical, but proven and effective. In parallel, we, in collaboration with Ruckus at this point, are also rolling out the red carpet for our global audience with a public cloud AWS version of the YBIP OS. That is including the Ruckus Smart Zone and soon R1, and the YBIP OS Radius, our own, and Analytics Engine. So we are ready to support you in launching and scaling your brand and managed Wi-Fi solutions. So get off the sign line and join us and test out this brave new world. And finally, as I wrap up this session, I have a call to action to other Wi-Fi vendors. Imagine being able to turn out solutions as varied as a coffee shop menu. I like to talk in, 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 in things. So, all thanks to our Wi-Bit OS Exo model. So choose your flavor. In this case, as you see here, it's a high density MDU opportunity. You can either serve it as a luxury MDU latte, a robust student housing espresso, or a budget friendly government subsidized Americano. So no matter the choice, telcos and MSPs gets to serve it under their unified brand umbrella. It's the art of customized Wi-Fi simplified. By outsourcing your solution R&D to the YBUS team, we become your EXO engine. We install YBIP OS in your private or public cloud and work with you to integrate it with your systems with our YBIP OS to enable a repeatable and scalable uh, rollout. And you are joining an ecosystem where your unique hardware and technology solution will be optimized for varied environments. Very much so like an HP laptop for the office or a Panasonic tough book for the field, both powered by Windows yet optimized for distinct users. Each solution is fine tuned to its purpose, but from the MSP and the telcos perspective, they manage a unified branded interface that simplifies operations across the board. In conclusion, we are Wybus, 
We bootstrapped ourselves, fueled by coffee and determination, no venture capital in sight. We poured everything back that we had into R&D, validating and refining our solution with Ruckus. And now as we stand on the cusp of a new chapter, we invite other equipment vendors to leverage our IPR and EXO engine to join and grow this white label ecosystem and share in its success as it comes true. Thank you for listening and we look forward for hearing from you and answering any question you might have. Thank you, Magnus. Uh, there was a lot of stuff in there. So I invite the audience who is interested in learning more about your solution to uh, to contact you. What comes to mind for me is, you know, and, and, and Michael, you, you touched around that, you know, you have private equity that integrate or, you know, uh, purchase different properties that have, let's say, you know, a different access point vendor deployed in there. How How do they, put all of this together, uh, we discussed, you know, the fact that property management systems are, uh, uh, you know, um, diverse and how do they all put all of this together in terms of their connectivity? Is this an issue you see, Kaylon or, or Michael or in, in the property space? So, absolutely. Uh, no question about it, especially with MSPs, they're in growth mode and they've got some funding, so they're trying to grow quickly through acquisitions. Uh, and you see those disparate um, technology platforms all over the place. So the, the idea of an open source style, uh, coffee driven, by the way, Magnus, I'm with you on the coffee, um, <laughs> approach to, you know, to interoperability, I think is, is fundamental to the future because let's face it there is no one winning vendor right so we have to anticipate that as a service provider or as a property owner or even as an investment uh body that those challenges are real and they require thought effort um and resources thank you and you kaylin you have any perspective from the property yeah. owners? From, from my perspective uh, and I mentioned it earlier, you know, what is defined what managed is. And it'd be nice to have a central source to know this is what managed is. And these are the things that you can do in a managed network. It would be nice to have a uh, a central source and some more collaboration on exactly what that is. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Julian, I haven't forgotten about you. Uh, you know, since we're approaching the top of the hour here. What initiatives for 2024 would you like to share with the audience um, that you're excited about? Well, I think there's a couple actually products that I'd love to mention that have just come out. And I think they'd be, the audience might be really interested in them. Okay. First of all, we put out our resident preference survey. Uh, we do that in partnership with Grace Hill. Uh, it's a great product. We have over 170,000 responses from residents, and it's a really, um, there's a deep dive both into the, you can look at nationwide data, but also data available for 77 different markets. Uh, and it looks at amenities and home features that are really important to residents, at how much residents are, are willing to pay for those amenities and home features, and what their biggest considerations are during the home search. So really recommend this product, really great. We have it for sale um, on our website, uh, incredibly deep dive with a lot of data so we know that people find that incredibly helpful uh, we're also putting out this week our um, a customer experience technology report uh, we did that in partnership with real foundations and that has some great data just high just a top line um, finding that i think is particularly interesting uh, 10 to 20 different solution providers um, are used by most multifamily operators to provide the customer experience um, and uh, the next 12 to 18 months, companies enhancing the res will be focusing on enhancing resident experience and renewal touch points. Uh, and certainly, as we know, the budget constraints are a significant obstacle. Uh, I, I think those are some really th that report, which come out later this week, will be really interesting. I think as you um, as you think about how you're deploying um, broadband and how you can honestly market yourself as well. 
Uh, the other thing, and I know Kaylin asked about this earlier before the call, so I want to mention it quickly. Um, one of the things that NMHC works on, we have a federal advocacy team and part of the government affairs team. And so in addition to the industry facing work that I do, we work closely with um, both the Hill and agencies and the FCC has a proceeding that we are heavily engaged on. They're actually voting on this tomorrow. So I want to flag it for you all. Uh, it's a final rule on prevention and elimination of digital discrimination. Uh, it's it, This comes out of the bipartisan infrastructure bill that or law rather that, that uh, Congress directed FCC to define and to end digital discrimination. The idea being that there's a huge digital divide and that we need to address that in NMHC and I think most likely everybody here would agree that we need to address that, that divide. However, the proceeding uh, is overly broad. It impacts both provide, uh, broadband providers and owner operators. Uh, the rule has the, the rules uh, definition is so broad that covered entities can actually include property owners, which is a huge um, development because FCC through con congressional does not have authority over, through Congress to re uh, uh, regulate op owner and operators. So this is a big significant change uh, and we have been fighting, we filed numerous comments, we have industry coalitions we've been heading up and we've met, I think we met with uh, four different commissioner's offices last week. We've gotten some support from some of the commissioners on expressing our concerns. Again, we really support the goals of the proceeding, but that we're concerned about the statutory, lack of a statutory authority given. And the, the, the important thing here, here is partnership. Broadband providers and owner operators work together closely to deploy strong connectivity to ensure that that service is, is is what the residents expect it to be. And so we work very closely together and that's an incredibly important part of the business model for both owners and for uh, providers. And so the comments that we've filed focus on two major points. Um, where the broadband market is failing, which I think we all know is where the, is in lower income communities. So that's rural areas and also lower income commute properties in, in, the, in urban areas that that is what needs to be addressed, not just this blanket approach to ending this digital discrimination without looking at the real problems. Um, and also that some of these policies are counterproductive, that while the intentions are good, that it doesn't understand the business models of the multifamily industry. We're a somewhat smaller subsector. People don't understand multifamily. That's a, I think we all here know that, but that's one challenge of trying to regulate an industry they don't understand. Um, so we've really focused a lot on that. There's, you know, there's been various efforts, a huge uh, investment by Congress and the bipartisan infrastructure law for funding to for deployment and also the affordable connectivity program for individual residents. Those have been big um, movements, Congress's recognition of the challenges, but there's a lot, a long way to go. So the vote is tomorrow. We anticipate that what the final rule will stay much like it is we have two commissioners expressing opposition to some of the um, parts of the rule and Congress is also watching this carefully so we're hoping to um, have this reevaluated. Um, and also we're considering getting legal action if necessary because we do think this is a really big significant deal for the industry. Um, so those are big things that I really want to touch on um, and I know we're short on time so I won't get into other product projects we're working on. So maybe for next time. So, uh, well, yes. thank you very much, everyone. Uh, in respect for people's times, I'm going to end the the webinar here. Uh, I want to thank the audience for participating. Of course, our panelists uh, for sharing their insights, and uh, see you at the next event. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.